You're good to go, Scott. Ick. Scott, you're good to start. Okay. All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, if you hear a little feedback, let me know. I'm, my wife is going downstairs, so her iPad doesn't give us feedback. We'll, we'll see how this works. So, um, even though a lot of folks down here have gotten the COVID vaccine, at least the first vaccine, um, it still becomes an issue about COVID and how we manage ourselves. Because even with the vaccine shot, of course, we're still going to need to be careful. And we've gone through a lot. It's now been about a year, and it's a lot to go through. So I would like this to be as interactive as possible. And I encourage if folks have questions to uh, jump in, unmute yourself and jump in, or uh, send it out in the chat, which we will be checking. Uh, and uh, make this as participatory as possible. Victor Frankel, a Nazi concentration camp survivor who died within the last year, said this is one of my favorite quotes, an abnormal reaction to an ab abnormal situation is normal behavior. This is one of the uh, basic tenets that I believe in as I work in trauma situations because there are so many things that come up that are abnormal, so many situations, and we all react to them differently. So to have what would be in other settings an abnormal reaction in trauma situations and difficult situations, that reaction is really normal behavior. And that's the basis of part of what we're going to talk about today. So the loss of normal routines of daily life, which certainly um, this COVID has done to all of us. It can undermine our normal capacities to regulate stress. We all have stresses in life. And it isn't the stresses that are the difficulty. It's really how we manage it. And the loss of normal routines make managing these stresses very difficult. In addition to that, the loss of social connectedness. One of the basic tenets of managing COVID is to socially isolate, to socially distance. Now, socially distancing to me is an oxymoron, but to social distance, the loss of social connectedness is especially important because it is a major protective factor when people are feeling the most vulnerable. One of the things that we do in working with people who have been through traumatic situations is talk about the great need is talk about the great need to um, to connect with people, to share the experience, to talk about it with other people. And one of the issues about socially isolating is that we can talk through Zoom, we can talk on the telephone, but we can't spend time together. We can't connect with each other. So that's difficult. So that loss of social connectedness is especially important as it's a major protective factor when people are feeling the most vulnerable. So a year ago, at the beginning of this, we all thought, first of all, it wouldn't last terribly long. And second of all, we didn't know how to manage ourselves. So one of the things that we might have experienced is feeling quite overwhelmed at this whole concept of all of a sudden this external force, this virus has come and impacted all of us. So we felt overwhelmed. We had worry, especially about the future. Anxiety, a sense of powerlessness. The world takes place around us and there are things that we can't control, but this virus made us powerless in that it was happening, it was spreading, it was spiking. All of these things were happening and we couldn't control it. We couldn't control our environment and so we had a sense of powerlessness. A level of impatience, 
Um, my assistant here just asked me um, if everyone is seeing your visual aids. Are they seeing, are you all seeing the screen that I'm putting up my screen sharing? Everyone, if you're not for some reason seeing Scott's um, screen, what you have to do is pin him. So he's sharing his screen right now, but if you're seeing a gallery view, basically if you look in the little box where um, you can see Scott, there's three little um, dots in the corner. If you hit that drop down and hit pin video, you'll only see him. So if anyone that's clearing up any confusion for anyone, but we are seeing you, Scott, and we're, you okay. know, we're seeing your slides. Okay. So feeling impatient. When is this thing going to be over? And as it has gone on and on and on, when is this thing going to be over? A level of irritability. A level of frustration. Again, with the length of time this is happening. Even anger anger situation, anger at the fact that we can't do all of the stuff that we did. Uh, Rana raised hand. Yes, Rana? Okay. Um, we have, might have had trouble concentrating. Disruptions in sleep and nightmares. I actually gave this talk about three weeks ago, and one of the folks was talking about having nightmares having the same repetitive nightmare that didn't make any sense. So having nightmares, having a fear of the unknown, feeling a detachment from others, especially feeling disconnected as we talked about a little bit earlier. Short-term memory loss. You know, as we get older, we all seem to lose certain memories. We go into a store and say, gee, how come uh, what, what's going on in the store? Why do we come into the store? What, why, why are we here? What, what we're going to pick up? But it accelerates. It gets worse uh, when we're under stress and trauma. A depression, a loss of control, an intolerance for others, especially family members with whom you're in quarantine. And that's particularly important because we're all in relationships. We all try to make relationships with folks. But we have all of these things that also create intolerance. So I want to stop here. And here's the participatory participation factor. And I want to ask people, any comments in any of these, any thoughts, any reactions, any things that people are feeling, um, yes, this is exactly what's happening. Anything you'd add to this. Uh, so please unmute yourself and uh, make comments. Does this resonate? Are, do, are people having had this experience? Is there anything you'd add to this list? I see a couple of people shaking their heads. And remember, this has gone on a long time. It's been now over a year. Okay. All I, all I was going to say is that I'm a generally pretty upbeat person, and I find blue days, which I never had before, where I just can't make myself do anything for the day. Mm -hmm. Yep. So Cindy's having a hard time sometimes motivating yourself just because you're feeling just whether that be depression, you know, momentary depression, or whether that be just feeling like I just, I just can't get up. Just can't do stuff. Other people have the same feeling. Yeah. It, it sometimes it feels, doesn't it? It feels sort of like just this, this wet blanket uh covering that, that makes it difficult to go and do some of the stuff we might want to do and there's all of ways that feeling of yeah well you know i'll do it tomorrow i just don't feel like doing it today i know i need to do it but i just I, i'll get to it i'll do it tomorrow yeah 
Now, all of these are indeed uh, different symptoms, if you will, of, of have gone through a very difficult experience. Um, and we can even call it a traumatic experience. I, I, I would call it traumatic with a small T, not a big T, but it's still an experience that you wouldn't wish on anyone else. And it's not easy and it's difficult to, to go through. So as we have gone through this and we hear all those things about um, ways we have to take care of ourselves, we have to wash our hands, we have to, we have to do this, we move into a crisis, right? So this situation, this COVID has caused a crisis. But crisis theory tells us that we can't be in crisis constantly because when we're in crisis, our adrenaline starts uh, pumping, um, we spike in things, but at some point that crisis becomes the norm and we can't constantly stay in the state of heightened uh, or anticipatory anxiety. We can't stay in heightened awareness when, as, as I know all of you have experienced from time to time, when things happen, you get really tense and you get anticipating something and, and you really work at it and you go into some type of crisis. But at some point, even though the situation might continue, you settle in and the adrenaline stops pumping as it normally is pumped. Crisis becomes the norm, but we get fed up with the crisis. Now this has gone on for a long time. This is now a year. We've become less vigilant. We get sick of wearing masks. All those who are sick of wearing masks, put your hand up, right? We're sick of wearing masks. Um, we stop washing hands so frequently. Well, you know, at the beginning of this, we probably all washed our hands very vigilantly. But I can tell you for me, I know that I've stopped washing my hands so frequently. Rather than six or eight times a day with warm water, rubbing the hands on and saying, uh, what was it supposed to say the, the the pledge of allegiance or whatever it was it was supposed to use that as a time for well you know what you just get tired of it it's 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 gone on so long that you get less vigilant you stop washing your hands so frequently it's more of a struggle to get other people socially to isolate especially kids you walk around and you see all these people not wearing masks anymore now maybe some of them are anti-masking some of them used to wear masks but don't anymore the whole thing as a society, we are so tired of going through this without much of an end in sight. Well, there is an end because we have a vaccine. But wait, we're told that even though we've gotten the vaccine, we still have to wear masks. We still have to be cautious. So it's more of a struggle to get everybody around us to, to socially isolate, to take the precautions that we so have worked so hard to do already during this time. We crave more social interaction and take less precautions in doing so. You know, the club is having dinners. The club had a Super Bowl party on the, um, on the driving range on Sunday. Yes, people are starting to, to socially isolate, but as you drive around, as you see foursomes playing golf, as you see people having dinner at the club, People are now spending more time closer together than they did at the beginning of all this. At the beginning of all this, we we're pretty vigilant about staying away from each other. But you can only go on for so long without worrying and thinking about it. I, I, I'm tired of it. So there is more social interaction. We are taking less precautions in doing so. We might feel the need to go out dining and shopping. Enough. I'm tired of staying in the house. I'm tired of being hyper vigilant about making sure that I'm going to be safe. So maybe we go out shopping. Maybe we go out dining. We take precautions in doing so. But as time has gone on, because crisis becomes the norm, we take more risks than certainly we did a year ago. Yet some of these initial reactions remain. Some of what we talked about a couple of screens ago the hypervigilance, the depression, 
uh, short-term memory loss. Um, we still have dreams. We still have nightmares. Um, it's still here. And we hear about it every single day. We listen to the media. And when you listen to the media, it tells you every single day what is the count of how many people have caught the virus, how many people have died today of the virus, what's the percentage of positive. And now we're hearing it even more because we're hearing about the Brazilian variant. We're hearing about the UK variant. So even though we're getting tired of having to deal with all this, in some way, this crisis has, has exacerbated. In some way, with the variants that are now here, it's even more of a crisis. And then we hear that we get some uh, vaccine, but we have to be careful because maybe the vaccines aren't as effective against the variants as they were against the initial uh, initial disease itself. So the danger still exists. But well, let me go back here for a second and talk about the crisis fatigue. Again, I want to stop and I want to ask people um, what their experience is because I know that Glenn Eagles has done a fabulous job at protecting us uh, during this crisis. Glenn Eagles has put in rules and regulations. Uh, we couldn't play golf for a while. We couldn't use the pools for a while. But Glenn Eagles has relaxed its requirements and even its protection of us as we have moved through the crisis. Now, part of that is they have learned more and said, you know, we can still be vigilant we can still protect people, but we don't have to do it in such draconian ways. But yet, there are still lots of rules, lots of ways that we can't do things. Uh, and people who are saying, you know, you, you still have to protect yourself. So um, thoughts or comments about that for anyone? Any Anybody want to share their experience, whether it be here at Glen Eagles or up in Toronto or wherever you might be watching this? I invite people to jump in here. I know that uh, Bill and, and Nisa Weisglass up in Toronto, for instance, um, still don't go out much of their, uh, they're up on the 10th floor, 20th floor, and they still don't go out much into downtown Toronto. Um, how about other people? What, what's your experience of, of trying to manage this while at the same time feeling like I'm tired of this, I, I, I just want to get back to my normal life? So how do you manage those two feelings? Karen, you want to yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, I did a lot of exercising. Uh -huh. Because I felt that when I did that, it uh, sort of like calmed me down a lot because it just gave me that incentive to, uh, you know, go day to day Yep. Just just doing that alone had had a great deal of help to me and my husband. A lot of exercise, walking, you know, before the gym even opened, uh, just keeping ourselves uh, on some Zoom exercising uh, and uh, following a lot of um, healthy eating. And we, we got through it. Yep. So not even necessarily doing it at the gym, but doing it in just walking around your neighborhood, doing it um, in in your own place, in your own residence. Correct. Yeah. How about other people's experience? Thank you, Karen. You're welcome. How about other people manage to say, I'm sick and tired of this, but I still have to function in it? Right. Yeah, Ray?
I think you might be muted, Fred. Now, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, I find I have a lot of anger towards people who don't wear masks, even though uh, I know it's inconvenient. I know it's uh, something that they're unaccustomed to. But their usual answer is when I approach them and say, put your mask on, or why don't you put your mask on? Oh, I, I don't breathe well, and I've been tested, and I took the vaccine. And, and quite honestly, as a, a, a former healthcare professional, it's not me that counts. It's what I, my relationship to other people. And, and I, I find I have a lot of angst and anger at, at, at these people, and it's... Sometimes it overwhelms me. I don't know if this is normal or what, but uh, I, I just find it's disrespectful. Yeah, I, I actually hear that from a lot of people. There's a lot of people who talk about the fact that um, in managing ourselves, we also expect and want other people to manage themselves too. And so when they don't, it is disrespectful and it puts us and other people at risk. Right. Um, and people sometimes just don't, aren't, aren't as serious or don't take it as seriously as we might like them to. And A, it's a disrespectful issue and B, it's, it's an issue about risk. So I, I think that's a good point, Ray. And I, I think that actually you probably, most people can resonate with what you're saying. Thanks. Other folks? Okay. So as a therapist, I'm actually pretty comfortable with silence. We don't want to have so, too much silence here, huh? So. The danger still exists. School is in session. The big question is virtual versus in person. Um, that's much more probably important for our grandkids than uh, and our kids for us. Sports for kids happen. I I'll tell you, uh, our grandson plays on a travel hockey team. He lives up here, down here in Boynton Beach now, and he's on a travel hockey team, and he goes all over the state. Uh, Orlando and Fort, My Fort, Fort Myers and, and uh, up north Daytona. And frankly, we are terrified. We are terrified because he's going into these arenas. Um, his parents tell us all the time that, hey, we wear our masks and we socially isolate as much as we can, but they go and they stay in hotels. The kid's playing hockey, he's 11 years old. It's scary. It terrifies us um, about the potential for infection, not just to us, but to him and to and all around. Um, sports are good for kids, but at the same time, man, it's, it's, it's difficult to manage because we are still in this crisis, in this pandemic. Is it okay to go feed shopping or do we still have to Instacart it? Uh, Instacart uh, virtual pickup is, is, makes life easy. Um, but, you know, when I Instacart it, I always get upset because when they send me milk that I order, they always give us milk that has expired in two or three days. So I, I want to go pick my own fruit and vegetables. I want to get my own bottle of milk and see when it, it expires. But, um, man, it's, we're still in this crisis. I just want to see my friends and family, especially my grandkids. Um, how many times I bet each and every single one of you have said that. I just... We're tired. We're tired of this crisis. I want things to go back to normal. And then we hear, you know, maybe six feet away isn't enough. Well, it's hard enough to manage six feet. Uh, the stores do a good job of putting out their little six feet lines, but six feet might not be enough. 
And when you're yelling and shouting, six feet isn't enough. So, man, how do we manage that, given all the rest of this stuff? And what social activities can I do? Can I play golf? Well, you know what? When there's four people playing golf, okay, I get it. We're all riding in the individual golf carts, which I am grateful and very thankful that Glen Eagles does. But then we go to tee off. Well, you know, you've got four people standing in the tee box. Um, how many people try to work six feet when you're standing in the tee box and people want to talk to you? How do you manage it when there's someone else out there, whether they're wearing a mask or not, but they come real close to talk to you? How comfortable are you being able to say, excuse me, back off, or please stay six feet away, or I'm backing off because I don't want to be that close to you? We have to be vigilant and continue to do that. It's not easy. And especially when you have people who, you know, I, I've had certain situations where I've said, I'm going to back away. And they said, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I forgot. No harm intended, not malicious, but it's hard to manage this as we continue to go through it. And then the frustration about winning to get the vaccine. Um, as I said, I think most of the folks here have had at least one shot. But I tell you, it wasn't easy work, was it, getting a shot? How many times did we call? How many people get up at six o'clock in the morning to try to get on the public's website? How many times did you go on to different websites? I know at least twice I was on different websites. And once I all the way, made it all the way through to get the appointment, but I never got a confirmation. And then when I finally got in touch, I said, yeah, a computer crashed. So how difficult and how frustrating is it to, to wait to try to get the vaccine? The danger still exists. It's frustrating. The whole process is frustrating. So um, again, I'm going to hold for a second and ask for a comment, question, uh, invite you to share your frustration, invite you to, uh, you know, there was a, there was a um, therapeutic uh, theory once that talked about primal scream, how important it is to sometimes, just, you know, what was that movie? I'm mad as hell, I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> so uh, I invite you to have a minute here to do your I'm mad as hell, I'm not going to take it anymore. And and Ray, you were really good expressing yourself about other people who are not wearing masks and how frustrating that is and how angry that gets you. Anger is a very big part of this. Anger is a natural human emotion. It isn't something that should be shied away. I, I prefer people use it constructively rather than de destructively. But anger is, is there and it's important and being able to recognize and acknowledge it. So I'm going to hold a minute and invite you to unmute yourself. And, and anyone want to add anything to this? Or talk about any of your frustrations? I sometimes get concerned because most of the people here, I really feel are um are being pretty good about this but then i hear people who are having poker games or gym games and they're in the same room and they're not wearing masks and they go well everybody else here is fine so i can do this and then they come and they play golf with me or we're down in the restaurant they're there and i keep questioning is this really safe is it not safe you know, anytime I get a sneeze or a cough or I'm tired, I go, oh, my God, did I catch something? It's a really hard process. And um, I really, truly believe that almost everyone in Glen Eagles is being very, very careful and respectful of each other's. But there are a few who just they like doing what they want to do and they feel comfortable because these are their friends and um, they just trust that they'll be fine. And it's hard to kind of reconcile yourself with the part of you that's worrying that you're going to catch it and the part of you that isn't. And, um, you know, I'm very conscious that there are a lot of people here that are older than we are, and I don't want to get them sick. And I also don't want anyone else to get sick. So I think it is something that's always in our head and concerns. Thank you, Ronald. Anybody else want to talk about any of this? Just jumping back here when I'm trying to move up. Okay. 
Okay. So, what can we do about it? First of all, controlling your exposure to the news. As I mentioned earlier, there is an everyday report of how many people get coronavirus, how many people have died, and it's constant. Now, it's really important that we hear this information. It's really important that we hear about the different variants. It's really important that, that Anthony Fauci gets to talk to us directly through the TV about what we can do to help ourselves, take care of ourselves and our families. And it's important to have the news. But at some point, the news, the process is traumatizing. At some point, you have to have permission for yourself to turn off the news, to say, I'm done listening. I can't hear anymore. I need to protect myself emotionally. I need to protect myself psychologically. And so I'm going to turn off the news. At the time 9-11 happened, people watched for days the airplanes going into the towers, days and days and days and days. And it was re-traumatizing on a constant basis. At some point, you have to turn off the news. You have to say, stop. I'm overloaded. I have to take care of myself. And I have to stop getting that level of stimulation, which is traumatizing. Though. So control your exposure to the news. Take care of you and your family. Set attainable wellness goals. I think it was Cindy who was saying that she's working out in the house and going for walks with her and her husband. Doing things to take care of yourself. Um, eat well-balanced meals. Maintain good sleep routine. Maintain daily physical activity. These are ways to take care of yourself. These are ways to make sure that you are in control of your life, that you are managing yourself. And as tough as it is sometimes, because it feels like there's a wet blanket out there, it feels like I just, I'll, I'll just put it off till tomorrow. I'm not going to go for the walk. I'm not going to go to the gym. I'm not going to sign up to, to do the class. I'm not going to do the Zoom class. Still, to push yourself enough to be able to go to take care of your body physically, to take care of your body emotionally. And then I haven't mentioned yet the alcohol and drug consumption. We use alcohol and drugs to enmesh ourselves at times because we can't handle things and we don't want to handle things. And I'm not going to be one who says you shouldn't ever drink. But I do think that in a time of crisis, it is very, very easy to slip into having that extra drink, having that extra uh, cocktail to, in essence, to anesthetize yourself. So I think that we have to be very vigilant and watch our relationship with substance because our relationship with substance can easily get out of control because it's so easy and it's so helpful in certain ways. I'm not saying you should never, not ever have a, a drink, but it is very easy to get out of control and often it gets out of control and we don't even know it. So I think avoiding uh, alcohol and um, drugs is, is really important. Be mindful of social media. Uh, and I guess that's the, the, very much like the first thing, especially that which increased anxiety or seems to obsess over the news. So the Facebook posts, the Twitter posts. Now, um, just when people go overboard talking about all of the things that are happening, you can really OD on it. You, really, you just have to control and, again, take care of yourself, making sure that you are in a good space and not overloaded with all of this external airtime that we can get, whether it be through media or whether you know, get through the TV or whether it be social media. Structure your time. It's really important to determine the things that you want to do and set them in a time frame schedule to do them so that you can structure your time and you're not just having hours upon hours of doing nothing. The difficulty is, again, while we're socially isolated, while we're not leaving home, while we're thinking, what else can we do, but I can't do anything, I don't want to go out, 
finding ways to structure your time. And we're going to continue about some other ways that, that can help you do that. Focus on what you can control. You see in the upper right hand corner the serenity prayer. I think that the serenity prayer is one of the most important pieces of writing that I've ever seen. And it has had such impact for me. To God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. The serenity to accept the things I cannot change to me is the hardest part of this equation. There are so many things in the world that I have such strong feelings about, that things I'd like to see different. I will work towards helping to change some of those, but there are things that I cannot control, and I have to accept the things I can't control, whether that be about my kids, whether that be about the coronavirus, whether that be about so many other external organizations and structures. Granting me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to work towards change or to change the things that I can, and then the wisdom to know the difference. Practice mindfulness, deep breathing meditation. Mindfulness is something as easy um, to, to respond mindfully, deep breathing. One of the very simple, easy ways of doing that is just to close your eyes at some point and focus on your breath and count to whatever that number is for your breath. Usually it's four, for me it's six. But breathe in, counting one, two, three, four, five, six, and breathe out. Three, two, three, four, five, six. And just letting your body just relax. Meditation, deep breathing mindfulness, visualization, whatever that is for self. And when you're doing this, especially when you're breathing, you know that there are going to be some thoughts that will enter in because it's very hard to keep your mind still. There will be thoughts that enter in. Allow them to enter in and then say, okay, I'm done with them. I'm going back to breathing. When you first start this, you won't be able to do this for more than 15 seconds without thinking about something. But let it be. Just let acknowledge that you're breathing in, acknowledge that these thoughts come in, and now I'm going to let it go, and I'm going to go back to my breathing, and just focusing on counting the number. So mindfulness, deep breathing meditation. We know there's a huge, huge body of research which talks about mind-body connection and how much mindfulness and meditation is helpful uh, and how much it contributes to good health for all of us. So practicing mindfulness, deep breathing, meditation. And then find safe ways to be social. Zoom, telephone, contact, visits while being socially distant. Um, we sometimes have uh, we had some lunch with some friends at some point, and they came and they brought their own food and sat in the backyard, and we had chairs set outside. They had chairs set outside. We were about 10 feet apart, and we had a wonderful conversation and a nice visit with them. So we could be in contact with them and we could be social, but we could also be socially distant and protect ourselves. Keep a journal. Um, journaling is a very important process because often when we want to talk to people, we can talk to people, but journaling is like talking to oneself. And you can have this conversation with yourself. It gives you a chance to let it out. It really is writing how you're feeling, writing how you're thinking, writing what you're doing. It is a way to get it out rather than keeping it all bottled up here or here without escape. Keeping a journal is a very important technique for good personal self-help. Empower yourselves by observing preventive hygiene habits, washing your hands, wearing masks. Well, everyone tells us that we should wash our hands, we should wear masks, all of that stuff. So I'm not just talking about doing it. I'm talking about making the clear, definitive decision. If I'm going to be empowered. I am going to do this. This is a positive way that I can take care of myself. This is a positive way that I can say, I'm going to make sure I stay healthy, and I'm going to make sure those around me stay healthy. So we're not doing it just because everyone says to do it. We're doing it because we make the determination. We make the individual decision 
that that's what we want to do. And that's how we're going to take care of ourselves. Create new adapted schedules, taking account into all that's been canceled. Well, as things get canceled and things are coming much more back into play, but understanding that, that we have adapted our schedules to take into account that what has been canceled and we are making our schedules to be what works for us. Again, empowering ourselves. Take you and your family and pleasure drives, especially when this first happened. Well, we have a little convertible down here. Um, we used to go put the top down and just drive along the ocean just as a way to get out, just as a way to do something that would be happy. We didn't have any necessarily place to go, but just put the top down and drive along the ocean. That worked for us. Do something that makes sense for you. What would work for you? Start a family game night. You know, start playing uh, backgammon together. Start doing something that you could do, you could have activity. We've been playing Canasta online now. We have three different couples that we play canasta with three times a week. And then often Rana and I will just play two-handed canasta with each other. Um, just to have something to do, it beats watching TV. Rediscover a favorite activity of a television series. I've heard many, many people talk about going on to Netflix, going on to uh, the different places and finding a, a TV series that, you know, whether it's a revisiting old one um, you know, ours is always Star Trek. That's my go-to. The different Star Trek, Deep Space Nine, Star Trek, Next Generation, whatever that might be, and watching it over again and laughing about it, or finding new activities. Uh, right now, we're watching The Travelers on Netflix, which is a, a, a new series. It's, it's three seasons that we found that we like. Preach and practice tolerance and acceptance within the family, within the couple, within the household. When we're cooped up together, when we have intolerance, when we have frustration, it's easy to start sniping at each other. We all do it. So when we get into it, thinking about being able to say, you know what, we need to practice tolerance and acceptance within the family. We need to be kind to each other. We need to be generous with each other. And giving yourselves permission to understand that you are experiencing an abnormal situation which leads to abnormal reactions. So again, I'm gonna stop here, ask people to unmute themselves. Any comments, any additions, things that you guys have tried to do, you'll see that up in the right-hand corner there is a stay strong because things will get better. It might be stormy now, but it can't rain forever. So um, by no means is this an, a, a comprehensive list that includes everything. I'm sure each of you have come up with things that you've managed so I invite you to make comment. I invite you to tell me if I'm wrong, but I also invite you to add to say what things have you guys tried to do and what have you found successful? Hey, Scott, can you hear me? Yep. It's Terry. Hi. Hey, Terry. Um, the last statement there, give yourself permission to understand that you are experiencing an abnormal situation which leads to abnormal reactions. And maybe you're going to get to this, but I guess I want to know what happens if, if and when life goes back to normal. How do we adapt? Because we've been in this over a year now. We all have new habits. How, how does that manifest itself afterwards and how do we go back? Well, I think that's a really good question, Terry. First of all, normal is not going to go back to normal as we have known it. Normal is going to have a new uh, definition. One of the things we don't know is we don't know about even how long these uh, vaccines even last. Um, like a flu shot, will we need to get her every single year? Um, will it last a whole year? We don't know. So we will have a redefinition of normal. And then we'll have to find out those things that work with us. So we have been much more socially isolated in the world, all of us. Will that continue? Or do we feel like we then have the uh, strategies and also the vaccines uh, and the mask wearing, which we still will have to do, to um, incorporate that into our daily life? So 
part of that will be redefining what is normal for us and the habits that we have uh, adapted, which you referenced, Terry, some of those habits we will need to maintain and hold on to. Um, some of those habits we find we might find have become dysfunctional. And when they become dysfunctional, we decide if we want to keep them uh, or not. If they're dysfunctional, hopefully we have the awareness to say, okay, I don't need to do that anymore. Uh, so when someone says, hey, do you want to go out to dinner? And your first automatic reaction is, no, I'm, I'm not ready yet. Well, maybe you get to a point where you do become ready. So we, part of that is understanding what those, uh, what these reactions that we've all have, um, some about what we talked about before, and then say, does it still fit? Um, there's still a lot of people, you know, you talk about herd, they talk about herd, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Herd immunity. Um, well, I don't know that we'll ever get to herd immunity because after all, we've got a whole bunch of a population under 16 years old, uh, right now under 18 years old, that won't be immunized. And then you've got a whole group of folks who say, no, we won't take the vaccine. So um, will we still need to protect ourselves to some degree about this vaccine? I, I think we will. I think it's going to take a couple of years, I'm sorry to say, but it's going to take a couple of years to, to really understand it. Most vaccines that we get have at least three or four years of testing. This one has not. This one has had uh, whatever it's been, three to five months of testing. So we really don't know yet. There are so many unanswered questions. And because there are so many unanswered questions, we are still going to have to protect ourselves um, by wearing masks, protect ourselves by some of these reactions that we have learned to identify. And it's going to be a couple more years until we get back to that sense of normal. And even then, normal will have a redefinition. Uh, Terry, does is that, is that answer your question? Yeah, it answers it, but it isn't really what I wanted to hear. <laughs> Sorry. That's OK. Um, I just, at some point, whether it's two years, five years, whatever, um, I'm still hoping that there's going to be a lot more sense of normalcy, but then we're all going to be five years older and who knows. So yep. thank you. Okay. Mark? Yep. No, oh, you can hear me. Good. One thing that Nisa and I do is we tell each other all the things that we have to be grateful for. And I find that is very therapeutic. For yeah. example, all you people at Glen Eagles <laughs> should be feel very, very grateful that you have the ability to get vaccines. Here in Toronto, we're still waiting. We're going to be waiting at least for another month or so. That's it. <laughs> well, thanks, Bill. So, um, of course, that's a personal issue about I can feel grateful. And you can tell us that we should feel grateful. And frankly, I do. And I talk to my friends up in Massachusetts who don't even have access to the vaccines yet. But um, understanding about some of the gratitude and gratefulness of, of uh, what we do have. Uh, the fact is 85 degrees here. And it's snowing right now in Boston. I feel grateful about that. So, uh, but yes, thanks, Billy. That's a, that's a, a, a nice comment. Thank you, Bill. I need to be reminded of that every now and then. My daughter does it regularly for me, but thank you. Hello, folks. And, and uh, yeah, Ronnie, you have a hand up? Take yourself off mute, please. Um, is it on mute now? Is it unmuted? Okay. Um, I think for me, it's the things that I always think that are kind of normal. Like down here, almost every week we go to an art show. You know, we would go to, I was saying, Scott, last week, I would love to go to a movie in a movie theater with other people. It's been a long, long time before we've done that. And just, you know, there's no way I'm walking down downtown Delray because no one's down there wearing masks and it's very crowded down there. And I used to love going there. So I think it's a matter of saying, 
where can I go? What can I do? What little steps can I take? You know, we've gone to, I think, two different restaurants with and met friends. And we've done it because the tables are really far apart from each other. Everyone's wearing masks and that feels okay. But, you know, it's thinking about when do I add the third restaurant? When do I add the fourth restaurant? And, and sitting outside. And sitting outside. I won't go inside a restaurant at this point. Um, and it's, you know, I think that for me, the best thing is to take it really slowly. Um, I'm blessed that we have lots of friends and what's, you know, what's wonderful now is between um, FaceTiming and Zooming, we can visit with people wherever they are. And so, you know, as Scott said, we, we sometimes play, can, you know, actually we have three nights a week of Canasta, which keeps us pretty busy three nights a week. But, you know, the other day I just was really bored. And um, I just called a friend from up north and said, let's talk. And she was saying, you know, I was just thinking the same thing. I think that we have to just keep pushing ourselves and trying new things. But when the world opens up again, I think I'm going to open up slowly, not super fast. The good news is we have our, we've had the second shot of the, the vaccine, which is nice. But it's still... You know, I don't, I've got, I've got kids who are younger and grandchildren who can't get the shots now. And so I don't want to give it to them. You know, I don't want to have the virus around me or anything. So I think I'm just going to take things slow and easy, but expand a little more and a little more now that we have the vaccine. Maybe we could go someplace as long as we still wear a mask. So it's a matter, I think, of just keeping trying. Thank you, Ron. I, I, I also want to go back, Terry, to your question for a minute about, um, so we have abnormal reactions and how do we get back to normal? And so the thought uh, also is, at some point, do we recognize and realize that the uh, reactions we have are not helpful anymore? They have become dysfunctional. And when they become dysfunctional, what do we do? Do we find a way around them and say, all right, I'm not going to do that anymore? Um, or do we hear from other people that, that the actions we're doing aren't working? And so there's always the chance and opportunity to go into therapy because sometimes what we have been doing isn't now working. And so being able to see a therapist, whether it be just for support, emotional support or whether it be ther therapist because we define that there are certain things that say hey you know what this isn't working in my life anymore it used to work but it's not working now and so maybe I should see a therapist um, you know one of the things about substance and alcohol uh, alcoholism is that people start drinking as generally speaking as an effort to solve a problem because they uh, are in pain because they have difficulty and so they need some to be anesthetized and so they start drinking. Well, pretty soon that becomes a dysfunctional way of trying to solve a problem and creates a new problem and that is an alcohol problem. So we all use strategies to try to help ourselves. When those strategies become dysfunctional, a non helpful that's especially time to go in and say, I need some help figuring this one out. But you can even go into therapy just to get some support, just to do some talking. And at this point, most therapists see people remotely. So I'll just add that plug for therapy. Anybody else want to make any uh, comments? I keep jumping here when I'm losing my scroll. So this uh, I don't know if any of you have ever seen this before, but this is the Chinese symbol for crisis. It's actually made up of two symbols. Wai Qi. Wai is a Chinese symbol for danger because in every crisis there's danger. Qi is a Chinese symbol for opportunity 
because also in every crisis there's opportunity, opportunity to learn new things, opportunity to turn on to try out new coping mechanisms, opportunity to learn about about yourself in different ways, opportunity to learn about others, opportunity just to learn new things in life. And to me, I think it's a wonderful encapsulation to what you achieve of crisis, because as much as there is danger in crisis, there is opportunity, and we will learn new things. We will learn new things about ourselves. Now, there are many crises that I wouldn't wish on anyone in order to learn new stuff. But as a result of every single crisis, there is opportunity and there is learning that takes place. So I'm going to ask you to take a minute to think about what each of you have learned as a result about ourselves, as a result of this experience with COVID. And I'm going to ask again, I'm going to pause and ask you if anyone's willing to share what you might have learned. I will have some on here, but I'm interested to know as anyone think about what have you learned about yourself as a result of this experience of, of COVID. Okay. <laughs> I learned to share a little bit with other people, concerned about people who are living alone, reaching out to them. Uh, it brought me to realize that we are like one big family here and looking out for each other. So that was very important to me. Thank you, Karen. Think anyone else? So it might sound like a strange question, but what have you learned about yourself as a result of this COVID? Scott? Yeah. What I learned about myself is the last 20 years, I would always say to myself, well, if I die tomorrow, I've had a good life and that's great. What this COVID has taught me is that I really want to live and I don't want to die. And even though I think I've had a good life, I want more. I still want to live. Excellent. Thank you, Billy. We want you to live. <laughs> After all, who else would play Canasta with on Monday nights? <laughs> Anybody else? Right? Yeah, I, I've learned to. I learned to be appreciative of those people that don't have the choices that I have. I, I looked out the window this morning and I saw the guys cutting trees and the other day they were cutting the grass and, and, and the people that are delivering food packages. And I got a, a, a couple of granddaughters that work in hospitals. And, and I, really, I really learned to appreciate those people that really don't have the same opportunity that I have sitting on my rear end and looking out at this beautiful Florida sky. Um, I, 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 I just think that everybody has to take a deep breath and say, thank you. I mean, even, even I, I had a little accident on a golf course and the paramedics came and they checked me out and they, you're gonna be okay and you're gonna do this. And the phone calls that come in, it's time that we should really appreciate human beings that, that are, are, are concerned about us and it wants me to be more concerned about them. And I don't want to start crying. So thanks, Scott. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. That was very well said. Anyone else want to share? So I'm going to list a few things and I can say with a 
good degree of confidence if every single one of these things I'm going to list, every single one would apply to everyone who's watching this now because we've all learned so much. We just haven't, I don't think, thought about it in this way before. Flexibility. Resilience. Compassion. Tolerance. Strength. Creativity. Adaptability. And gratitude, appreciation. But I can say with a great degree of certainty that everybody here has learned some of each of these over this last year as we have struggled to manage during this time of COVID. Comments, questions? I think I've learned to be compassionate to myself as well, that if I don't accomplish the things on the list, I have a lot of time on my hands now. And if what I do one day is knit and read a book and take a walk, then that's okay. Yep. Very good, Cindy. Ray, are you going to say something there? No, no, I'm just okay. listening to everybody. Okay. I didn't know I was on speaker. <laughs> so I'm going to close by asking you this one question. And in this coming new year, what skills, behaviors, or characteristics would you like to acquire for yourself? How would you like to define yourself differently over this new year? Partially as a result of COVID, but also in just reflection of the new year, what would you like yourself to be? And I will certainly open the floor, although this is a question which uh, you're, you're welcome to, to talk if you want, but also just to contemplate. So if anyone wants to share, you're welcome to share. And that's okay because this is one of those questions that are probably best just to think about. So I am thankful that all of you took this hour or so to share with me your experiences. And I hope this has been helpful to you. And uh, I'm glad to Lenny Gills and Jamie and Karen, thank you for allowing me to make this presentation. Thank you so much, Scott. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Scott.